We're here at the U.S. Naval Observatory where they keep the official time in the United States. The observatory's been around since way back in 1830, and they've been keeping official time since 1845. That's when the Secretary of the Navy had a time ball installed on top of the telescope dome. Now that ball was dropped every day precisely at noon, so everyone in Washington could set their timepieces. And ships out on the Potomac River could check their clocks before putting out to sea. Today, that ball has been replaced by more sophisticated clocks, giving us the most precise time in history. So why would the U.S. Naval Observatory become our official timekeeper? The answer was centuries in the making. Well, the reason the Naval Observatory is our official timekeeper is because we have been doing it for longer than any other institution in the country. The observatory was founded in the year 1830. We are the oldest continuously operating astronomical observatory in the country and the oldest scientific research organization operated by the federal government. Our mission in 1830 when we were established was to determine a time scale that we could use to calibrate all of the chronometers in the U.S. Navy inventory. Chronometers, of course, are vital for celestial navigation for determining position. So we began as an institution to serve the Navy by producing a time scale, and that mission gradually expanded over the years so that we provide time for the entire country now. So, navigators came to rely on timepieces known as chronometers to find longitude on long voyages. But how exactly does that work? Well, a chronometer is actually just the name that's applied to a very well-regulated clock that is designed to operate on board a ship. Now, when you think of the technology that was available in the mid-19th century, clocks, the really precise clocks, were basically pendulum clocks. But if you put a pendulum on a wooden sailing ship, it's not going to work. It's going to bang all it's over the place. It's going to bang all sure. over the place, right. and it will not keep a regular time. The chronometer was designed to work on board a ship, so it had a mechanism that was not perturbed by the rocking of the ship or pounding into the waves and that sort of thing. The problem with chronometers, as with any clock, is that it is a mechanical device and no matter how precisely you machine the parts and assemble the thing, no two clocks are going to be identical mechanically, which means they are going to keep time at slightly different rates. One might be fast, one might be slow. If you can calibrate the rate at which a chronometer changes against a defined standard time scale, then you can determine or you can use that information to uh, compensate for your chronometer so that it is keeping the precise time scale where it was calibrated. If you know what time it is at the location where the clock was calibrated, you then use sextants and other navigational instruments to determine time at your unknown location. The difference between the time that you determine at your unknown location and the time on your chronometer is the difference in longitude between your location and the location where the clock was calibrated to the standard time scale. So that's how you find longitude. Okay, let's put that into practice with a little experiment. Say you're in Chicago and you use a sundial to set your watch. Next, you drive about 770 miles west to Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Then you check your sundial, and you see that the time is one hour earlier than what's on your watch. What you've learned is that as long as you drive directly east or west of Chicago, a 770-mile trip will change your time zone by about an hour. Back before the 19th century, nearly every town kept its own local time. Locals would set their watches based on the town clock striking noon, much like the ball dropping here at the U.S. Naval Observatory. But the world needed a more standard way of keeping time. Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT, is world time, the basis for every world time zone at the center of the time zone map. It's called Greenwich Mean Time because the world measures time starting at the prime meridian, which passes through the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England. This actually came about from an international conference that took place here in Washington in 1884. At that time, the world adopted the concept of standard time. And each time zone spans uh, essentially one hour of 
Earth rotation time, uh, essentially 15 degrees of longitude with a standard time meridian in the middle of that. It's kind of like slices of an orange, if you can think of it that way. Mm -hmm. um, now, that became standardized in 1884 by international agreement. Today, the U.S. Naval Observatory operates an atomic clock that counts by fractions of a second, tiny bits of seconds. We couldn't possibly see them go by. Now, clocks have evolved over the years because we have always wanted to try to find a way of making more precise clocks, of being able to count fractions of seconds more precisely. So over the years, we have found different things that allow us to do this. So we went from pendulum clocks to the idea of taking a small piece of quartz and passing an electrical current through it, and it vibrates really fast, and we can count those vibrations. But to be at the absolute cutting edge of timekeeping, we actually look at systems that occur inside atoms. And basically what we do is we measure very specific frequencies of what we call hyperfine transitions in atoms. Those only happen at very specific frequencies. So if we can find atoms that will behave this way under the right circumstances, we can then use those atoms as clocks. And so today, a second is defined as the interval of 9,192,631,770 transitions of the hyperfine state of cesium-133 in a vacuum in the absence of external magnetic fields. That's one second. That's pretty precise. There are uh, many applications that are now driven by precise time. Probably one of the most Certainly the most demanding one that we have right now is the global positioning system. This is a network of satellites which allow you to determine your true position anywhere on the surface of the Earth to an area that's about the size of your living room. In order to do that, we have to make sure that the time that we generate at this facility comes out at an astonishingly precise rate. So our clock can't vary by more than one billionth of a second per day. Most of us in our day-to-day -day lives never encounter time intervals that are much shorter than one millisecond, which is one one-thousandth of a second. One one-thousandth of a second is one million times longer than one nanosecond which means that a timing error of one millisecond will be one million times longer than the timing error of one nanosecond. So think of it as a million feet, which translates to a position error of 300 kilometers, 186 miles, or for many of us, the next state over. Atomic clocks are important to gadget heads like me with all the consumer electronic toys that I use, like the computers, digital recorders, MP3 players, cell phones, you name it. All of them are synchronized with the atomic clock. All of those fractions of seconds that flash by in the face of atomic clocks add up to minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, centuries, and so on. Time measurement has evolved over the centuries from telling time with a sundial to measuring longitude with a chronometer to synchronizing devices with an atomic clock. But one thing has never changed, there's never enough time to have fun.